Mrs. Braithwaite, uh, Mr. Miletic, uh, Mr. Uzratov, <clears throat> dear fellow judges in the room and all over the region, on behalf of the European Court of Human Rights, my colleagues here and also joining us um, from afar, it is a great pleasure for me to be finally in the region to take part in this very eminent and important colloquium and dialogue between judges who have as their mission to protect and defend the values, the rights, the interests protected by the European Convention on Human Rights. I think I can safely say we come together at a transformative point in European human rights protection. I think it is important that we take this debate extremely seriously and we try to understand what unites what is required for the judiciary to continue to perform the functions as allocated to it within a governance system based on the rule of law and the separation of powers. Last year's chosen subject was the pandemic and its relationship with the European Convention on Human Rights. The topic you have chosen this year is equally crucial. It is intricately bound to the rule of law it is the independence and impartiality of the judiciary. There is indeed a link between the concept or the problems arising by the pandemic and the independence of the judiciary, and I will touch upon that later in my speech. Maintaining the independence of the judiciary has been a priority theme of the recent Greek and German presidencies of the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe. The reason for this political focus is obvious. It is extremely important for the Council of Europe as an organization of pan-European protections of these principles of human rights, democracy, and the rule of law to be very robust in its protection and enforcement of the independence of the judiciary. Why is that? That is because the rule of law is under pressure in some of our democracies, in Europe and indeed worldwide. We see challenges, both direct and indirect, to the independence of the judiciary. This forms part of a culture of democratic backsliding that we have been witnessing for the last years as a concept used and utilized by the Secretary General of the Council of Europe in her recent report, State of Democracy, Human Rights and the Rule of Law, a democratic renewal for Europe. The Strasbourg Court has developed a body of case law on this subject along with the right to a fair trial by an independent and impartial tribunal established by law. In particular, as we will discuss during this forum, we have received applications by domestic judges who complain about disciplinary proceedings, dismissals and demotions under Article 6, 8 and 10 of the Convention. They are becoming increasingly more high profile and politically sensitive, many of these cases. I want to congratulate profusely the Air Center and Civil Rights Defenders for their recent publications on the independence and impartiality of the judiciary. The editors, Biljana Braithwaite, Katharina Harby, and Goran Miletic, and the main contributors, my good friend Lady Bianco and her colleague, his colleague Hannah Smith, lawyer at the Air Center. This is a very impressive compilation of the most recent case law of the court and of the European Court of, Just of Justice and will serve greatly for any considered debate on the issue. In a great number of speeches as president of the court, I have ad addressed what I have called the fusional relationship between the rule of law and the independence of the judiciary. Today I want to take a look at this theme from uh, a different angle, attempting to do two things. To understand why is the judiciary now being challenged, both at the structural level, but also being very much a focal point within the larger political narrative and developments in our part of the world. Secondly, I will try to provide some concrete suggestions of counter strategies to attempt to mitigate and hopefully overcome 
some of these challenges. In an online symposium organized by Diritti Comparati and EU Law Live in April this year, which was, and I'm very privileged to say, a response to a recent article that I published extrajudicially, the rule of law as the lodestar of the European Convention on Human Rights, the Strasbourg Court and the independence of the judiciary, the opening piece by the editors stated quite starkly, the rule of law in Europe is under pressure. As a cornerstone of the rule of law, the independence of the judiciary has itself become a target. But why are we seeing these attacks on the independence of the judiciary? As we all know, the judiciary is one of the three powers of any democratic state. An efficient, impartial, and independent judiciary is integral to a functioning system of democratic checks and balances. I'm very happy to hear this morning Dr. Pavel Uzvatov make a very, very important point for our deliberations. And it is a point we as judges have to make also within the larger political context of this debate. When we are discussing the independence of the judiciary, we are discussing it from the perspective of its functions in the service of the people. We are not an, in an act of self-preservation. The independence of the judiciary is not to safeguard the self-promotion or self-interests of the judges themselves or their egos. It is a who need to be protected and preserved in a, in a system which is true to the rule of law and the separation of powers. And this is a message we judges have to make clearly in any political debate on this issue, because it is often couched in terms of judges trying to simply protect their own skins. But that is not the case. The role of the judiciary has evolved over recent decades with the number of cases brought to the courts multiplying and with judges being called upon to decide on issues of political, social, and economic importance. We could say that the justice system has been called on to play a more and more important role in society. Now, this is all very logical in a system based on the rule of law and in societies like ours, which have become more and more complex over the last, say, 50 years or so. The fact of living in a rule-based system will eventually and inevitably create disputes about the content of those rules. And for such a system to function, to be meaningful, for such a system to be sustainable, independent arbiters, independent dispute resolution systems with courts independently ascribing that role uh, divorced from uh, the parties to the disputes is absolutely crucial. So as a result, the judiciary has increasingly had to examine the actions of the other two state powers. It is too... Uh, easy and simple to claim that judges are simply taking these powers over and above their assigned roles. Judges are actually dealing with these issues because they are brought to them by the disputes that arise in society. And it is the role of judges to take a position on disputes regarding the content and the scope of the law. If we take the pandemic as an example over the last 18 months, National courts have received a large number of challenges to the actions of the executive. The pandemic has led to important restrictions, not just to our civil and political rights, but also to our economic, social and cultural rights. Vulnerable groups have been particularly impacted. Domestic judges have faced the difficult task of making sure that the public health emergency has not been used by the executive as a pretext for human rights infringements, as just mentioned by Biliana Breithwit. There is a difficult balance to achieve of ensuring public safety on the one hand and enjoyment of fundamental rights and freedom of the others. Not all of the decisions taken by courts will be appreciated by the governments and the temptation to publicly speak out against unpopular decisions may be even greater. Here we see how judicial independence intersects 
with a pandemic. But let me be absolutely clear. One cannot fault the judiciary in having to take a position on difficult issues relating to pandemic-related infringements on fundamental rights. That is part and parcel of the fundamental role of the judiciary in any system based on the rule of law and the separation of powers. If we contextualize the role of the courts with the onset of populist governments, we see that a possible tension is created. Populist governments may express impatience with the institutional checks and balances which the judiciary provides. The result may be a temptation to weaken or replace the independent components of government, such as the judiciary or ombudsman institution. And I'm particularly happy to hear that we have representatives from these institutions. For example, the deputy ombudsman of Kosovo with us here today. Judges may be targeted by politicians or, their, or, or the media in claims being made that judges are overstretching their role. These claims are often extremely simplistically uh, laid out and they need to be discussed, they need to be dealt with on the merits. We don't have to look very far, for example, and some come even from our most established democracies. Constitutional courts, and I'm happy to hear that we have many members of constitutional courts from the region joining us today. These courts can be particularly vulnerable to attack. Why is that? Because once they are weakened, the very institution which is there to prevent future violations of constitutional rights is no longer able to fulfill its core function. International human rights structures, such as international courts, are also vulnerable to attack for the same reasons. The European Court of Human Rights may be perceived by some governments as getting in the way of specific governmental objectives, for example, being tough on criminals or reducing migration. But the European Court of Human Rights' very reason of being is to preserve and protect the fundamental rights, in particular in situations where there may be a democratic overreach. That is the whole pur purpose of the institution that was created by the European Convention on Human Rights. International human rights treaties are potentially then within this context painted by these governments as standing in the way of national sovereignty. That is a long debate, but a debate we need to have again on the merits. So that is my diagnosis. Now what about the cure? We may feel powerless in the face of attacks on the judiciary because the solution a respect for the separation of powers seems to lie exclusively, exclusively in the hands of the executive. But let's also be very clear about the fact that we, there is a communications exercise which is extremely important in times like these. And I want to talk more about that in the latter part of my intervention. I would like to highlight some potential strategies which could, which could help reinforce judicial independence. And I hope some of the points that I make in this keynote speech can be points that we develop throughout the next two days. <clears throat> My first point draws on the online judicial forum organized by the Air Center in Bosnia and Herzegovina a couple of months ago. I was privileged to give an intervention there. I underlined the need to promote a better understanding of the work of judges within our democracies. Courts can try to proactively shape the external environment in which their judgments are perceived. This could take the form of increasing the public's awareness of the significance of its judgments through press releases or via creative use of social media. Outreach activities such as court visits can increase legitimacy and influence. Information directly communicated from courts can also have help to counter false information circulated by populists. Ensuring that the public understand why independent courts are so essential in a democracy is fundamental. I have said many times before, times have changed. It, the time is over where courts were mystical features, clo cloistered monasteries, where judges would hide behind closed doors only to disseminate judgments without further ado. Judges now are part of the landscape that needs communication enterprises. We need to be open to disseminating, to make people understand the work we are doing. P 
public confidence, again turning to Mr. Uzvatov's very important point, is the cornerstone of protecting uh, judicial independence. And judges must be a part of the process of creating an informed grassroots environment in every state. My second point, my second strategy, judges themselves may have to speak out against government reforms in a proportionate way. And the European Court of Human Rights has discussed exactly this in the famous Grand Chamber judgment in Baca versus Hungary, where the court stated, and I quote, questions concerning the functioning of the justice system fall within the public interest, the debate of which generally enjoys a high degree of protection under Article 10. Even if an issue under debate has political implications, this is not in itself sufficient to prevent a judge from making a statement on the matter. Issues relating to the separation of powers can involve very important matters in a democratic society, which the public has a legitimate interest in being informed about and which fall within the scope of political debate." Closed quote. I have myself, in my role as President of the European Court of Human Rights, taken this teaching of my own court to heart. I think it is very important for those judges of the court that have the ability to do so to be part of a conversation, of course, a conversation that on behalf of the judge always needs to be within the boundaries of the judicial role. My third point focuses on judicial ethics. This is an important issue as well. We judges have to set ourselves to the highest standards. Independence and integrity are two sides of the same coin. When judges do not live up to the high standards of integrity expected from them, public mistrust is understandable. A corrupt judge is not a judge. Judges have to be very mindful of the important ethical principles that have to be preserved for professional conduct of importance. The court itself, the European court, has recently updated its own resolution on judicial ethics from 2008 to respond to the new challenges of the 21st century such as the presence of judges on social media. These new guidelines have just recently come into force. My fourth point is influenced by the work of the Council of Europe's Consultative Council of European Judges, and in particular, opinion number 23, 2020, on the role of associations of judges in supporting judicial independence. I, ha I have used another term. I discuss the European community of judges, and I mean that with a capital C. It is as the CCGE called upon all member states to provide a framework within which the right of a judges to associate can be effectively exercised. One of the most important objectives of associations of judges to create a robust European community of judges is to establish and defend the independence of judges, safeguarding their status and seeking to ensure adequate working conditions for them and to foster and improve the rule of law. My fifth and final point is concerned with judicial training. Judges who have received excellent training on convention principles and the court's case law are better prepared to react to attacks on their independence and impartiality. This is why the court and its registry cooperate with the Council of Europe's HELP program, which provides training materials on Euro European human rights law, often setting out the standards, not just of the European Convention, but also the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. That is important because, as I have argued elsewhere, there is a symbiotic relationship between the Strasbourg and the Luxembourg Court on the rule of law issues. The importance of training is also why the Superior Court Network, established by the court six years ago, and now coming close to a hundred courts at European level membership also provide seminars on substantive aspects of the rule of law. I would also like to mention the in incredible importance of diversity on the bench, diversity of backgrounds, gender diversity, gender equality. Judicial benches need to be composed of peoples with varying views points it is in the variations of viewpoints that the law develops coherently across the fields. So let me conclude 
The rule of law is more than a series of procedural rights. It is one of the foundations of an effective and meaningful democracy at the heart of the core values of the Council of Europe and the European Court. The rule of law is not a slogan. It is not potential and a tool for political manipulation. It is the fundamental structural principle which governs the way in which we see the structure of European societies. It needs to be reinforced. It needs to be redeveloped. It needs to be embedded even further. Judges should talk about the rule of law at any opportunity and use the opportunity to try to teach and make people understand what this concept is all about. This concept is the fundamental prerequisite for stability, prosperity, and happiness in democracies. The judiciary's fundamental role in a democracy is to guarantee the very existence of the rule of law, and thus to ensure the proper application of the law in an impartial, just, fair, and efficient manner. The judiciary also plays a key role in the convention system itself, acting as one of our compliance partners, applying the European Convention as a Strasbourg judge, of first instance. Those judges sitting in the hubs make it clear that you are our first and most important guardians of the convention system. It is primarily for you to make the convention come alive. The European Court of Human Rights is a safety valve there to assist in the national enforcement of convention uh, principles. The convention system needs a strong and independent community of human rights judges. As I've said on many occasions, without independent and impartial courts, there can be no convention system. Without independent and impartial courts, there can be no rule of law and there can be no separation of powers. I've attempted to focus this second part of my intervention on possible responses. Because while the situation in Europe is extremely worrying, and I'll be very frank, we are certainly not powerless in response. Thank you very much indeed. I look forward to hearing the interventions of the other speakers and the discussions on the way forward. Again, thank you very much.